WoW has never shied away from interesting antagonists in its history and has managed to create iconic characters that last for years to come. Some can debatably be forgotten pretty quickly and only serve as filler for the actual baddies of Warcraft. In this video, we're going to go over some of the best Warcraft villains in the game's existence. When it comes to judging the placement of the entries on this list, we're going to be going over how iconic they were, their impact on the game's world, and the history they left behind after their defeat, if they had been. Starting us off at number 10, we have Eridicron the Stone Skilled from Dragonflight. Some people might be surprised or even fully disagree with such a newer character's placement on this list. Eridicron, despite his relatively short history throughout WoW, has climbed the towers of becoming the player's favorite antagonist in a very long time. From his design to his purpose, Eridicron has stapled himself into WoW for many years to come and players are only left guessing what his next move will be in eager anticipation. Eridicron would be known as one of the four primal incarnates of WoW. The incarnates were originally proto-dragons before the era of the Aspects, and were known to have rejected the gift of the Titans that would evolve their various brothers and sisters. The incarnates would instead turn their efforts towards the natural elements of the land and become an incarnation of the elements themselves, depending on which they saw fit. In Eridicron's case, he followed the elements of Earth transforming his body and warping him into a proto-dragon made of rock, and wielding the powers of Earth itself. Eridicron is considered the leader of the four incarnate characters, and presumably the strongest, as they all answer to his call and listen without question when he's present. His commanding presence and careful strategy in handling the player characters and the aspects they discussed has grown many players fond of his character. Eridicon is one of the three incarnates which would make their hatred for the Titans known, and show a force of open rebellion against the Aspects by attacking Eltharion himself. Their war raged for many years, but the Incarnates were ultimately defeated and sealed away, rather than killed, because Alexstrasza couldn't bear the burden of slaying her once clutchmates. 20,000 years later, Eridicon's sister, Razageth, would be freed by Kura Grimtotem, and Razageth would succeed in freeing her siblings by perishing in the process. Eridicron and his remaining siblings would venture together and claim a device that once belonged to Naltherion and reveal the Zaralek Cavern, an underground laboratory where Naltherion would create the Drakthir and many more creations like the Shadow Flame, where Friak would bathe himself and become stronger as ordered by Eridicron. During this process, Eridicron had struck a cunning deal with the Infinite Dragonflight and would acquire the essence of Galakron, the largest and most terrifying proto drake to have ever lived. In these events, players can actually fight Eridicron, but doing so will trigger the events of Murazon, hailing the end of the world as it once had at the end of Time Dungeon, forcing players to allow Riddicron to gain access of the Father of Dragons and stop the rise of Murazon. This tactic shows how calculated Riddicron is, as he doesn't underestimate the player characters and leaves them with ultimatums. Players would be forced to watch Riddicron succeed his plans and depart with a taunting but cryptic message, leaving the fanbase to only speculate what mischievous plan the Incarnate has hatched. As of now, we do not know the whereabouts of the Earthen Incarnate, as his last known appearance was through a Void Portal after the defeat of Chrono Lord Dios. This portal presumably leads towards the next expansion, The War Within, where it will face off against Zalatath and her Nerubian armies. His hatred for the Titans and those that follow their order can be seen with empathy, as the clues we have been given show that the gift the Titans bestowed was very much forced in some regards. As a progenitor species of Azeroth, one can see why this sudden change can be looked at negatively. Eridicron hasn't existed long enough to truly rise above other entries on this list, but he has earned his spot as a top villain to many, and his journey has only just begun. And at number 9, we have Sire Denathrys from the Shadowlands expansion. Denathrys would serve as the main antagonist of the Shadowlands story in its infancy, and even patches following as a lesser known villain. His design of gothic royalty and pretentious speech made players almost immediately fall for his nature. Denathrys displays himself as an incredibly charismatic and heroic leader to his people, responsible for upwards of trillions of souls for the redemptions due to his countless age and understanding sins. He's typically very calm and confident in his work and shows off his power in such a proud manner that it could be taken for egotism, as he thinks of everyone beneath him with the exception of his living blade, Remornia. Denethrys shows he genuinely enjoys speaking with his weapon, and the sword follows his commands with statistic glee, carving and slicing the very sits from mortal beings. The biggest takeaway from Denethrys, outside of his looks, is his intelligence. He shows a mastery in the understanding of death across all the cosmos, and even created an entire race called the Dreadlords. And at number 8, we have Kel'thas Sunstrider. Kel'thas would be known to players all the way back in Warcraft 3, and would watch his primary journey into TBC in Shadowlands, 
Though, in Shadowlands, Kel'thas appears more as an ally to the character and aids in the anima drought of Revendreth, rather than actually act as an antagonist. So his lore in Shadowlands won't be considered. Kel'thas would be mostly regarded as the former prince of the Kueldorai people, a race of highly intelligent elves that wielded magic and power. Kel'thas' story would derive from tragedy, losing his kingdom to the Rising Scourge at the personal hands of Arthas himself. With nearly 80% of his people killed by the Scourge and his city completely lost, Kel'thas would soon learn of a hunger taking over his people. The High Elves originally required the Sunwell to keep them healthy and without addiction to mana. With the Sunwell destroyed with their city, this hunger began to take form and Kel'thas was forced into troubling alliances. Kel'thas was no power-hungry fool, and only wished for the best for his people as his father, the King, Anisterian Sunstrider, was killed by the Scourge and left him in charge. Players would greatly empathize with his backstory, and understand his themes of loss and attempting to fix broken things. His struggles were taken over in rage and vengeance, clawing down a road never intended for himself. Kale would eventually meet Illidan Stormrage, who would offer his people sanctuary and aid in their magic addictions in exchange for their aid against the war against the Legion. Kael'thas immediately accepted this bargain, and had even further hoped that Illidan would cure his people entirely. During the events of the Burning Crusade, a portion of the now Cinderai people would train under the tutelage of Illidan to become demon hunters and lead an assault on Argus to defeat them. Kel'thas became alienated to even his own people, as he began to wield the magics of Fael and its power would gnaw at his mind, beginning to drive him mad, but believing this was the only cure to the addiction his people possessed. He became angered at his inability to keep his people safe and would be contacted by Kil'jaeden himself. Kil'jaeden would offer him and his people sanctuary within the Legion if they joined their cause. For the time, this was refused. Kel'thas would establish a foothold for his people with another storm called the Tempest Keep, a massive building filled with magic that can permanently hold his addictions at bay. He would be defeated as taking position in such a place told his people the alliances he secretly made with Kil'jaeden, after initially refusing him. His people would not desire such a fate and would put down their prince later in the Burning Crusade, though his corpse would be reanimated and returned. He would continue to serve the Legion and his skin had become a sickly pale color and noticeably thinner. His aggression had developed tenfold and any and all action made upon him would result in anger. He would reclaim his lost city of Silvermoon and use the reborn Sunwell within it to summon his master Kil'jaeden. Even on his second defeat, Kel'thas would scream in hate for his enemies and had entirely lost his purpose in attempting to help his people falling victim to the manipulation of the Legion's masters. His legacy would be felt all throughout Warcraft, as, ironically, his quest to cure his people led them to require even larger amounts of fell magic to stay situated. He's viewed as a traitor and sold his people and himself to a terrible force. Kel'thas' tragedy is felt by the Blood Elves almost constantly, and is a lesson to all about the terrible price he had paid in his quest for both the vengeance upon Arthas and redemption in his people. And at number 7, we have Lei Shen, the Thunder King. Lei Shen would be introduced into WoW in the Mist of Pandaria expansion. Lei Shen was the former king of the Mogu, a tyrannical race of previously Titanforged creations that enslaved countless races across Azeroth, and built an empire so vast no empire after it hasn't even compared remotely to what the Mogu created. Lei Shen's early life was just like a normal Mogu, but as the son of an unnamed warlord. His father would be slain and Lei Shen would retreat somewhere else in search of his former master, fated to myth, Ra Den. Lei Shen eventually discovered his master and found Ra Den had actually just given up and stopped performing his duties after learning that his own masters, the Titans, were killed by Sargeras. Lei Shen, receiving this as a betrayal and an insult, would rip out the very heart of Ra Den and consume its power, becoming the Thunder King we know today. He was hailed as the most powerful warlord in Mogu history after stealing the power of Ra Den. Lei Shen proved his power to the people of Pandaria by challenging the most powerful of the August Celestials otherwise known as Wild Gods, and defeating Zuin, the god in question, in a duel. Their duel would last an entire 30 days, and Lei Shen would eventually prove victorious, chaining Zuin to the mountain and forcing him to witness Lei Shen enslaving the people he protected. Lei Shen would sweep the lands, and quite literally no one could oppose the threat he imposed. Because of the Thunder King's massive success and lore tying to the Titans, players have grown to view Lei Shen as a true fan favorite. His existence heightened the known lore of Pandaria further and elevated old aspects that players had already enjoyed. His design and overall method of tyranny and anger towards its enemies was admirable, and players loved to see him win. He would unify many of the once Titanforged races to join his empire and offer them sanctuary under his rule. Some believed Lei Shen was a Titan Keeper reborn with the massive power and strategy he possessed. 
he would learn the mastery of the Cloud Serpents and turn them into thundering versions of themselves, heightening their strength for his soldiers. Lei Shen was depicted as the definition of pride and selfishness, using all that warred with him simply as fodder to claim what he truly wanted. Due to Raden's absence, Lei Shen legitimately would believe he was continuing the work of the Titans. Because of this point of view that Thunder King held, many could understand Lei Shen's futile attempts to repair things. His entire life was of war, and with the Titans present, things were simpler and more orderly. Eventually, Lei Shen would be defeated after attempting to claim the Forge of Origination, a Titan system that was placed onto Azeroth that had the ability to wipe out all life on the planet in order to cleanse corruption, should it take hold. The Forge was used on Lei Shen and his armies, wiping him from existence. He would be brought back to life by his Zandalari allies millennia later, and he would attempt to continue his previous work, but would be put down once again, this time by the player characters. He's been brought back once before, and it's possible we could see him again. Lei Shen installed himself as a true favorite, and hailed pages upon pages of lore with his addition. The impact he left is still felt by all races of Pandaria today, scarring the lands permanently, and the mere mention of his name leaves the lands filled with dread. Though, because he only existed for a single patch for us to actually explore his character, he doesn't quite find himself higher on this list. And at number 6, we have Queen Ajara. Ajara, in more recent years, would be known for her role in the BFA expansion, serving as the Queen of the Naga people, ruling the city of Nashtatar. Ajara's character, before her corruption into the Naga Queen we know, was once the ruler of all the Kaldari when its empire was at its peak over 10,000 years prior. She was beloved by all of her people, and practically no one saw her in a negative light. Because of her people's massive love for her, it would create an ego so massive that she believed every decision she made was perfect, and that the Kaldari were the superior race in all of Azeroth. With this mindset in place, the Mad Titan Sargeras would approach Ajara and offer her to join his Legion of Demons so that they may cleanse Azeroth of all the inferior races that were not Kaldari. She would use the Well of Eternity, a massive font of arcane power with the literal lifeblood of Azeroth within it, to summon the Legion into the world. This would set forth the event of the War of the Ancients, where many resident Azeroth races and gods alike would be slain in an attempt to combat the demons. Ajara wouldn't care less for the carnage she created, seeing it as anyone against her as lower. Eventually, the demons would be pushed back into the well and its power destabilized, causing the Sundering. This event would shatter the entire world's continent and split the lands apart, triggering catastrophic world disasters. It would destroy 80% of Kalimdra's landmass and create the Azeroth we see in modern WoW. Not many characters can claim such a feat that shakes the very world itself, and forever holds impact. Azeroth would never truly recover from this event, and the consequences it brought forth are still felt today. This wouldn't be the end for Ajara. As when the well was destroyed, her empire would sink into the depths as the land shook as she attempted to hold back the oceans themselves. She and her people would drown until approached by the old god, Nazoth. Nazoth would offer them sanctuary should she serve him and rebuild his empire, promising what Sargeras once had. Ajara would accept this deal but with the condition she is not a slave and can continue to rule as queen of her people creating the Naga we see today. She would go on to orchestrate dozens of events in WoW's lore at the behest of her Naga, but most notably during BFA. Ajara would corrupt Tide Sages and begin making her presence known by manipulating multiple sides of the war in the name of Nazoth, employing the aid of Sylvanas Windrunner to bring the Dark Blade of Zalatath into her hands. Zalatath was originally meant to be used upon Nazoth by Ashar herself to break free of her service to Nazoth and slay the Old God, but her attempt had failed as both the Might of the Horde and Alliance would defeat her, and Ajara would be taken away after Nazoth's freedom. She would later be seen in Iolotha being tortured for her transgressions, pleading that only she can defeat Nazoth, and once we free her, she is never seen again as of now. Her impact was felt globally by all characters of Warcraft, whether they know it or not, and players have adored her cocky attitude and cunning plans. It's not impossible to ever see the Naga Queen once again, and many have asked for her return. The overall regal feel she delivers and the I do no wrong mentality is a breath of fresh air to many, giving her this placement on this list. And at number 5, we have Deathwing the Destroyer. Deathwing would exist in the game's lore all the way back to the days of Galakron and become one of the most iconic and well-known dragons in not just WoW, but fiction as a whole. This is partial to his design, his tragedy and overall power he possessed in the lore of WoW. Deathwing has such a massive amount of lore that going over it in detail could be a video on its own, so we'll try to summarize it. Basically, Deathwing was the former Black Dragonflight aspect, and would be driven mad by the influence of the Old Gods. 
The very weight of Azeroth itself weighed on his shoulders, and the burden was too much for him to bear. He once served Dragonkind and the denizens of Azeroth with honor and was viewed as a true protector. During the events of the War of the Ancients, Neltherion, before it became Deathwing, would convince his dragon allies to pour their power into the powerful artifact that would defeat the Legion in one swoop. This was a lie and was immediately turned onto his siblings, and he would reveal himself as Deathwing. From there on, his corruption would harbor a hatred for all mortal kind. Any rational thought had completely left the dragon's mind, and the artifact he used to defeat his fellow dragons would become so attached to him that it began to tear and rip his body apart, threatening to kill him. He showed genuine loyalty in the old gods and their cause, and no longer exalted the responsibilities of the titans. The old gods would free him of his massive burden, and would succumb to their whispers over time. His return to Azeroth would send natural disasters across the world and destroy many portions of the land. It would be compared to the presence Azara once created when the Well of Eternity exploded, dubbed the Cataclysm. Players would understand the problems Deathwing held and can't entirely be upset at his willingness to leave his job. Obviously, his methods were extreme, and was unknown at the time that accepting the power he craved would drive him more mad than before. Deathwing had also experimented on his children and created an entirely new race prior to his corruption. These experiments in Altered Dragons exist even today in the forms of characters like Abyssian and the Drakthir. Their entire existence is simply because of Deathwing, and the impact he left even in his death. His horrific creations threatened to consume him from the very beginning, and the denizens of Azeroth would be left to pay for his mistakes. Deathwing can be recognized almost everywhere, becoming, arguably, the most famous dragon in WoW lore, even if his in-game fight was kind of a dud. And at number 4, we have Garrosh Hellscream. Garrosh was once a fierce orc of the Horde, mostly known for his time in Northrend leading the efforts against the Scourge. His tactics were brutal and efficient, heralded him as a hero to the eyes of the Horde citizens. He came from a troubled past of his father, Gromash Hellscream, who had been known as one of the first to drink the demon blood and doom the orcs to a permanent stain of the Legion. Garrosh sought to reclaim his honor and crush anyone that opposed his forces. He would directly follow under the tutelage of Thrall himself and be promoted to War Chief during Cataclysm, as Thrall was required to depart with the problems Deathwing had caused. Garrosh was left with little options, as the world was ravaged by Deathwing and resources were at an all-time low for the Horde. Not much would occur for Garrosh himself during Cataclysm, but he would become more fierce of a leader, ordering the conquering of the human city of Gilneas and claiming various lands for the Horde. He'd sweep the lands for the resources and do what he must for the Horde, whether it was morally right or wrong. Most notably, Garrosh would be the direct cause of the bombing of Theramore, destroying another aligned city in its entirety and all of the citizens and soldiers within. Garrosh believed this task would earn the respect he needed from Bane and Vol'jin, but was met with horrifying disgust from his peers. This began the downward spiral of Garrosh completing morally wrong tasks in the name of the Horde, and he'd stopped acting in the face of honor. In Missa Pandaria, a brand new continent would be revealed, and all Garrosh saw was a land ripe for the taking. He would dispatch the Horde and claim all of the parts of the land that he could. His conquest continued in similar ways to Theramore, killing innocents and even intentionally allowing members of the Horde towards their deaths in his name. Players would be elated at such a character, but also, understandably, upset. He was dealt with a heavy hand and was never taught true restraint. All Garrosh understood was carnage and war, and he would see his future. It built resentment for him and not only the players, but the characters surrounding him. You would love to hate him, and wanted to see him get up to even more mischievous acts of war. As described by Koak, a dragon ma or who would rebel against Garrosh, the Horde is his army, but we are not his people. Garrosh demands loyalty, but to him, that just means dying at his command. He doesn't know what loyalty is. Thrall inspired loyalty. What Garrosh wants is obedience. It reminded players of the Dark Horde and its more brutal roots, and Garrosh would eventually focus his rage into the old god Yasharaj. He would succumb to his own arrogance and follow his pride, plunging the Horde into open civil war to the point that the Alliance were forced to join the rebellion due to the power Garrosh possessed with the forces of the old god on his side. Garrosh saw a world bathe in his image, scorched and ruined for only orcs to reside in, as they were the strongest race to him. Garrosh would be defeated and put on trial, leading eventually into the events of Warlords of Draenor, where he creates the Iron Horde with a past version of his father. Garrosh would meet Thrall once again and claim it was Thrall's doing that became what he had. Thrall would slay Garrosh, and with his death, the effects Garrosh had left on Azeroth were felt beyond just destroyed lands and homes, but the lives of upwards to millions. Even those that survived his onslaught would be permanently scarred and potentially never recover. He truly left a mark in the world, but his effectiveness across multiple expansions was loved by all. 
He even returned in Shadowlands for a brief cameo, showing he was still so proud and wouldn't change a thing about his actions before killing his captor. It's likely we'll never see Garrosh again. But even for a few seconds on screen, an expansion viewed in a pretty negative light was received incredibly well. For our third to last entry, we have Sargeras. Sargeras has existed in WoW lore for decades and is viewed as the ultimate bad guy of all of Warcraft lore. Sargeras was once a former Titan, ruling across the cosmos with his siblings in a group called the Pantheon. His general purpose was to keep the cosmos clean of corruption and make sure all things were as the Titans envisioned. As Sargeras went about his efforts, he would discover multiple planets overtaken by a mysterious force that he would come to learn as the Void. These planets were typically harbored by the Dreadlords, a demonic species that dabbled in trickery and powerful magic. These Dreadlords would be questioned by Sargeras about what took over these planets. The Dreadlords would explain that they were not harbingers of the Void and only wielded its power. They'd go into further detail that these planets were completely taken over by a force called the Void Lords a cosmic force so strong that it rivaled that of the Titans. The only problem is these Void Lords were too large and existed on different planes than the Titans and could not directly influence planets. So to combat this, they would send up portions of themselves to take over planets and corrupt them with the hopes of taking over a planet with a Titan world soul within it. Basically, a Void-powered Titan with no will but the Void Lords themselves was considered to be so incredibly powerful, it could wipe out all life in existence. This immediately drove Sargeras into a panic, and he cleaved the planet in two with his massive sword. Such a force would cause the Titan to spiral into paranoia, and his solution was to create a massive army and corrupt a world soul of his own to defeat the Void. This plan was viewed as flawed by his siblings, and would be killed by Sargeras because of this. Sargeras would journey across the universe and destroy thousands of worlds with his endless armies we know as the Legion. Sargeras would be responsible for potentially trillions of lives lost in WoW's lore, corrupting and changing all that opposed him for the betterment of the universe. Chris Metzen himself would refer to Sargeras as the big bad of Warcraft lore, and was essentially the cause of most of its events. It's impossible to play WoW and never not hear a mention of his name somewhere, as his influence spreads to almost everyone. He's incredibly iconic in the game's history, and without him, we wouldn't have as much lore as we do. For our second to last entry, we have the Old Gods. The Old Gods in WoW would be known specifically to players as Cthune, Yasharaj, Yagsaran, and Nazoth, and the artificial Old God, Gahun. Each of these gods would have their own abilities and strengths, an example being Yagsaran as a sadistic yet cunning force so deeply rooted in his prison that he can still influence those around him to follow his commands or Nazoth, an old god who chose to remain confined for thousands of years and waited for the perfect moment to strike when the world's defenses were lowered, proving him a weaker force overall, but a patient strategist. The old gods themselves would be extensions of the Void Lords, previously mentioned in the Sargera segment. They were beings of incomprehensible power and would land upon Azeroth and aim to corrupt the world soul from within. Their forms were deeply rooted in Lovecraftian mythos taking the form of nearly shapeless beings with tumors and body horrors in areas that don't make sense to the human mind. Before Sargeras' crusade, the Titans discovered that these old gods were so powerful that they were rooted into the planet itself, and removing them could damage the planet or potentially kill it outright. So the Titans elected to imprison the old gods instead, and left their Titanforge creations in charge of watching their prisons. Their very existence is what sent Sargeras himself, the big bad of WoW, into a spiral of slaughter and war. He could never truly succeed in killing Azeroth to cleanse his corruption, and was fearful of it being overtaken by the presence of the Old Gods. The Old Gods would prove victorious in enslaving the Elemental Lords, various Azeroth races, and even Titan Keepers. Likewise as Sargeras, it was hard to go anywhere without mention of at least one of the Old Gods, and the scar they left on the world. It's also known that you can't really kill an Old God, and it's never impossible for one to return. This means players will eagerly await the return of the theorized hundreds to thousands of ideas of their plans. The mysteriousness and unknown nature of the old gods is their greatest strength as characters, as the fanbase can only speculate their actions and will just be happy to see them present once more in any sort of content pertaining to them. Without the old gods, we wouldn't have Sargeras, and many other entries on this list such as Deathwing, Ajar, and Garrosh. Even though they have such strange forms, they become greatly iconic and known to all players to the point people have learned of their presence outside of WoW fans. For the final entry in this list, we have the Lich King, otherwise known as Arthas Menethil. Arthas' history is incredibly lengthy and would require an hours long video, but to summarize it, Arthas started off as a paladin as the prince of the human kingdom of Lordaeron. 
he would serve his country well and do anything to protect it. When a devastating plague came to ravage his lands and people, Arthas jumped at the chance to protect them. This plague would turn the living into undead and quickly wiped out a large majority of life in Lordaeron. Arthas would investigate these killings and discovered it was orchestrated by the dreadlord Malganus. He would vow to destroy the demon and would track him down to Northrend. In Northrend, Arthas's quest for revenge drove him to the brink of madness as he sought out a blade by the name of Frostmourne, at the behest of his close friend, Mirrodin Bronzebeard. Upon finding the blade, Arthas was warned it was cursed, but was willing to take on this curse in the name of Lordaeron and to avenge the fallen. While the blade would prove effective in slaying his enemies, Malganus, Arthas's soul was claimed by the cursed blade, and slowly his mind would be warped and forever corrupted by the Lich King. The Lich King would instruct the prince to commit many atrocities, including ransacking his entire kingdom. Eventually, Arthas would be used as a pawn to summon the Burning Legion in Azeroth, but with some sanity left, Arthas chose to become a bigger part of the world's defense and sought out the Lich King's icy throne. He would merge with the presence within the armor that sat atop Ice Crown Citadel, and hence became known as the Lich King and no longer Arthas. From there on, he would slumber and not awake for many years until the release of The Wrath of the Lich King, where many diehard fans of Warcraft 3 had been waiting a very long time for their favorite character to arrive. The Lich King would be defeated, but not without his general presentation of powers towards the players and showing how truly outclassed they were at the start of the war against him. The former Arthas never truly wished to become as he had, but did what he felt was necessary to restore his kingdom. Arthas would be the embodiment of all of that as WoW's content and what it has to offer. Tragedy, morally difficult decisions, dark tones, lessons learned and lost, and general epic aesthetics. Arthas would undoubtedly be Warcraft's most popular antagonist, and is viewed as the peak of Blizzard's writing by many. The Lich King was so popular, in fact, that you cannot think of WoW without picturing the iconography he created. Many media outlets over the years would make references to the Lich King, and some areas would directly try and mimic what Arthas was in their own style. None could truly recreate what Arthas embodied, and fans constantly miss his character. Blizzard themselves has had trouble remaking what Arthas once was, and they cling to his popularity in many ways. With the release of Classic Wrath, Blizzard would create new promotion material for Classic that previous versions never saw. Things like remastering their original cinematic of his expansion trailers, new art, and various collectibles in physical form due to his popularity. Blizzard leans heavily into the impact Arthas left on the game, and knows that without him, WoW may never have reached its peak, and allowed for many years into the future for it to thrive. Alright, and that will complete our list. Overall, WoW has an insane amount of antagonists within its history, and it can be extremely tough to pin down which ones are truly the most iconic and known throughout the many years it's existed. Thankfully, Blizzard has and continues to produce content that players will forever hold dear to their hearts. Were there any characters on this list you disagree with or wish were included? Be sure to let me know why, and I'd love to hear it.